Good morning and welcome to our webinar and roundtable discussion, Serving the Needs of New Arrivals, Undocumented and Refugee Children in New Haven. I am Edwin Colon, an attorney at the Center for Children's Advocacy, Teen Legal Advocacy Project. It is a great morning here across from New Haven Green. We've been very fortunate to use the space at Spanish on the Green. And we want to thank Natalia Xiomara Chiafo for allowing us to use her office space. With me this morning is my esteemed colleague, Alice Rosenthal, an attorney with the Medical Legal Partnership Project at Yale New Haven Hospital. Also with us is an incredibly talented and diverse group of panelists who will take part in the roundtable discussion scheduled for later on this morning. Uh, for the sake of um, those of you who are participating in the webinar, will allow them to introduce themselves so you can familiarize the voice with the faces that are on the screen uh, before you. Uh, so I'll pass it on to our panelists so that they can start their introductions. Hi, I'm Kim Jewers Daly. I'm from Clifford Beers Clinic and I uh, manage our New Haven Trauma Coalition as well as our school-based services. So we're connected with several schools in New Haven. And um, why I'm here today is of course that we know that trauma is a big um, experience uh, in regards to undocumented and refugee children as well as their families. And um, as many kids do show up to school, we know that many families do not. And so Clifford Beers is really committed with the New Haven Trauma Coalition as well to really bring services um, to the families, not always have them, you know, have to come to our doorstep. Um, so that's why I'm here. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caprice Taylor Mendez. I'm Strategic Program Manager at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. And I have the privilege of working with many of these lovely people around the table. And the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven has a commitment in supporting nonprofits and groups that support immigrant rights. And we're also having the privilege of being part of a statewide collaborative of uh, funders that have come together across the state of Connecticut to want to pull together our resources and encourage lifting the voices of those who are doing the work to look at how we can move forward, not just um, obtaining greater resources in support of immigrants, but as well as continuing supporting them in their policies. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Kimball again. I work for IRIS, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services. Uh, the mission of IRIS is to help refugees and other displaced people uh, establish new lives, regain hope, and contribute to the vitality of Connecticut's communities. I've been with IRIS for five years. I'm the manager of youth services. Um, there are, IRIS welcomes about 400 individuals every year. Half of those are children. and as the manager of youth services, I'm responsible for helping families register their children for school. Um, I advocate for families within the school system and help connect uh, individuals in the school system with families. I want, I want to thank everyone for taking time of your busy schedules. And uh, we have a great panel uh, and uh, want to um, say that um, this has been uh, really a privilege to uh, I, I know many of you and, and work with you uh, in the past, so I, I look forward to our discussion later this morning. Um, just some housekeeping issues. Um, on the screen, you have some um, information regarding if you have any technical issues with the webinar, please email us or call us during the, the, the webinar so we can address any issues. Uh, to hear the audio, um, please, again, use your computer speakers, and if, if you can mute your audio, that will be really helpful. Thank you. Um, any questions during the webinar um, or um, comments can be directed to uh, Daniela Aguila um, at uh, kidscouncil.org. And we will provide you a copy of the PowerPoint and any handouts uh, immediately after the webinar concludes. We'll email that to you.
So this is what we were hoping we'll cover this morning, or we're hoping to cover this morning. Um, we'll have two parts of um, this webinar. The first one will be uh, talking about some legal advocacy strategies to access education, health, and mental health services. Um, and the sub part of that will be parsing out some education issues uh, pertaining to in English language learners, uh, students with interrupted formal education, special education, and college benefits. And, and then my um, dear colleague, um, Alice Rosenthal, will talk about access to health and mental health services um, in, uh, in terms of access to state and federal benefits and pro bono or in-kind services, which is very limited. Uh, the second part will be the round panel discussion. Um, and, and really, the, the purpose of the discussion is to talk about common experiences that indicate any um, systemic problems related to access issues for immigrant and refugee children and their families, and also identify potential advocacy strategies to address those systemic problems. So let's get right into the uh, presentation. Um, why did we think about just uh, narrowing it uh, to these three main concerns. Um, in our experience, in, in terms of our practice in our office, well, we see we, we certainly provide legal advocacy for kids um, in terms of uh, children who have been abused, neglected, or abandoned. Um, and the experience of many of the kids that we represent is that they have also have many unmet education, health, and mental health needs along the way. Um, and that's what we were, we were hoping we can talk about this morning, how to address those needs with the uh, limited resources that may be available to, to meet those needs. Um, I thought it would be important to start with some definitions. And, and again, this is not um, necessarily the, the best definition, but it's one way to describe uh, who is it that we're describing, who is it that we're talking about this morning. Um, so we, we um, undocumented children, uh, it's a foreign born person who lacks a right to be in the United States uh, because they've entered without inspection uh, and have not obtained a right to remain or have stayed beyond the expiration date of a visa or other status. These are some numbers and I, I want to sort of point to um, the top of the screen. Um, this comes from the Migration Policy Institute. They've um, actually, as a think tank out of Washington, D.C., um, and they have, they're quite reputable. They have put together some um, numbers from anal analyzing the U.S. Census uh, data. Um, and um, in terms of unauthorized population in the state, it's estimated that about 108,000 uh, people uh, in the state are um, undocumented. Of that number, um, about 7,000 uh, are reported to be under the age of 18. There's also the issue of unaccompanied immigrant children. Um, this is, I think, many of you uh, obviously are very familiar with, uh, uh, and it's particularly in the summer of 2014, there was a lot of uh, media attention to the number of kids that were coming from Central America uh, unaccompanied. Um, over 800 kids have been released by the Office of Refugee Resettlement to live in Connecticut with a family member or someone that can take care of them while they await immigration proceedings. Um, and so that is, that is a significant number as well. Um, in terms of definition for refugee children, um, this, is, this comes from the convention relating to the status of refugees, um, two things someone who is outside of his or her country of nationality or habitual residence and is unable or unwilling to return due to a well-founded fear of persecution um, based on his or her race, religion, nationality, uh, or membership in a particular social group. And these are some numbers as well regarding the refugee population in Connecticut. Uh, about 3,000 refugees from across the world have re uh, settled in Connecticut since 2010. This comes from the uh, refugee Processing Center of the U.S. De State Department. Um, and you can see the numbers on top in terms of countries. Um, and it seems that the country with the highest number of uh, refugees uh, resettled in Connecticut, it's Iraq. So we're going to talk about a couple of things in terms of rights of undocumented and refugee children. Um, 
They have uh, the right to a free public education, and we're going to sort of unpack that a little bit, and some college benefits. So, so we'll talk about those uh, in the next few slides. First, I want to share with you a little bit about uh, enrollment. Uh, and again, this comes from the Migration Policy Institute. Um, about um, 9,000 children um, uh, from the ages of 3 to 17 um, who are uh, undocumented um, will be eligible to enroll in, in school, but only 8,000 are enrolled. It's still a high percentage of students enrolled, about 90% of the kids get enrolled in school. The, the, um, well, let's dial in for the The sun. right to a free public education was, um, has been decided in a Supreme Court case in 1982 called Piler versus Doe. Uh, and it's basically the, the notion that all children and youth between the ages of 5 and 21 who have not received a high school diploma have a right to attend the district where they reside. However, there's this has been um, Interpreted in later decisions, in 1983, a decision has indicated that uh, its school district may require students or, or their parents to provide proof of residency within the district. Um, it is, however, unlawful um, to inquire into a student's citizenship or immigration status or that of their parents or guardians um, because that is not relevant to establishing residency within a district. I want to just caution it's you that tough. we've actually managed some cases in our in our practice uh, where um, the student um, inadvertently, uh, or perhaps because they they're not aware of this uh, very discreet um, statute in, in, in federal statute, um, do provide a copy of their visitor's visa, their B1, B2 visa, to the school district as a form of identification, and the school district has denied them accommodations. Uh, we've seen that in a couple of school districts in Connecticut. Um, and the statute, uh, uh, a statute that Please enter your access code followed by the pound or hash sign to B7, um, it's really the, 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 um, the uh, penalty is really on the student uh, to enable audio control, please enter your audio enroll, pin followed by the pound or hash sign. If you do not um, have a pin, just In terms of potentially lose their visa status as a, as a visitor visa. Uh, as a uh, prohibition in enrollment. And, and, and that is, that is a, a correct, incorrect interpretation of the statute. Um, so if you hear of these cases, and if you do want to hear about them, please call our office so we can... Um, address those cases when they come up. So what we want to do over the next couple of slides is just to come up with a framework to, to figure out the issues of kids who interrupt their formal education, and we'll define what that is in a couple of minutes, um, who have English language learning needs and require um, students with interrupted learning, uh, ELL needs, and special education are at higher risk for dropping out due to stress, literacy, and academic gaps, which lead to high levels of frustration and feeling defeated. So think of this is the, that concentric uh, figure on top of the slide. Think of the perfect storm. If someone has all three or may have all three issues happening at once, um, school districts will all usually spin their wheels trying to figure out what is really happening? What is sort of the chicken or the egg question? What is causing this student not to learn? What, it, what is really going on? Is it because they did not attend school for a number of years in their country of origin? Is it because they're learning a new language? Is it because they have a, a bona fide disability that prevents them from learning? And so what we're going to try to do is figure out first what are, what are definitions for um, meeting criteria for eligibility for all uh, three services, and then sort of figuring out some uh, legal strategies in addressing those questions that come up during. Come up during. Come up during. Students with intellectual this is not defined in the statutes. This is not something you'll find in the statutes. Um, but some definitions, and this is a great resource. It's Colorín Colorado, um, which is an ELL. Um, think tank website uh, provides a lot of uh, resource information on this issue. 
Um, the, um, these are newcomers with two or more years of education, interrupted learning in their native country, or who have attended school in the US, returned to their native country for a period of time, and then returned to the US again. So this is what we call circular migration, right? Someone moves between the United States back to their country of origin, uh, and then return back to the United States, or they can move from one state to another, right, or one city to another, and there will be some gaps in their education. Maybe they've attended kindergarten in English, maybe in terms of um, their second language, first and second grade in their first language, and then jump back into their second language in third. Again, these are sort of some of the examples that describe the back and forth that some of our kids experience. It's not just an absence of education, but also um, the uh, sort of going back and forth in terms of their learning. I think most of us are familiarized with English language learners. Um, schools have an obligation to identify kids who may have uh, English language learning needs. Uh, and they do this by doing a, a, conducting a home language survey at the beginning of every academic year. Um, they have to test kids who, um, and so the survey goes out and one of the questions is, what is the primary language spoken at home? Um, the, the, uh, and then if um, this sort of creates a presumption that the child may have a particularized um, language learning need, um, they have to test that child using something, uh, the test called the Language Acquisition Skills Survey. Um, they also, school districts have the uh, obligation to inform parents on, in their native language. This is when notices go out to the home, if they know that the family uh, speaks a, a particular language, they should be able, or they should, on their, on their, on their federal law, um, they should in, uh, make that uh, communication available in their native language. Um, provide ESL or bilingual education, and we'll describe the difference between the two. Uh, and evaluate the child's progress as they're getting services, uh, ELL services. These are some numbers in terms of um, undocumented children uh, in terms of uh, English proficiency. Um, and it's, it's a sort of interesting number, right? Um, about 42% um, of the kids do not speak English you know, very well or don't speak English at all, right? So that's, that's, that's very telling. That's sort of the top five languages spoken at home. Spanish, uh, it's prominent, but about 61% of, uh, of the children uh, in this, this uh, slide. Um, you can also get more specific data uh, for cities and towns. If you go to the Connecticut State Department of Education, um, and you look at the uh, strategic school profiles. So there's some really great data that you can find on the State Department of Education website. Uh, and I, I was hoping to get some for New Haven, um, but I thought it will, it will be a lot of numbers uh, for, for one presentation. Um, the um, data for refugee children, this is national data. Um, this is the top 10 languages that uh, in terms of kids coming into the country. One thing that may jump at you is that um, we may assume that Spanish will be the top language that refugees speak uh, or the refugee population may speak when they come, but it's not, right? So it's Arabic, right? Uh, and in Spanish falls right somewhere in the middle, right? So it tells you a little bit about the refugee population. You know, who, 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 who are the uh, people who, in terms of demographics, who are the people who are coming in as refugees? So English language services, it's usually provided in two ways. One, uh, and again, some people even argue three different ways, um, but we'll focus on the two that traditionally are offered in, in our school districts. Uh, one is um, sort of a, a notion of English as second language. Uh, certified teachers who are trained to teach English to foreign language speakers regardless, regardless of native language. So this is not kids being taught in their native language. This is getting additional support in English, right? With um, 
with perhaps some um, some some minimal uh, uh, support in their native language. Bilingual education is teaching both in English and the student's native language. Um, and so this is the sort of the, what it looks like, right? So um, I am first arrival here from uh, you know Mexico. Um, I don't speak English, and uh, there is one school that has been designated as a bilingual site. I will probably get all of my content area courses, all my math, all my you know all my sciences in Spanish, and um, during that process, I'll start um, also receiving instruction in English to learn English, right? And how, how is it that the, the um, State Department of Education determines that? Um, so if in any particular year, there's one school where uh, you may recall at the beginning, I talked about the um, home language surveys, right? If those surveys demonstrate that there's at least 20 kids in a particular school that speak a particular language, then the following academic year, right? So this is 2015, 2016. That survey indicated there's 20 kids at a school here in New Haven that speak Spanish. Next year, 2017, 2018, that school becomes a bilingual site school and classes will be offered in Spanish for a group of, of students, okay? So they will receive bilingual education. If there's fewer than 20 students, then school only uh, provides uh, ESL services. Um, there's been a recent change in the statute. Um, it used to be that students could only get up to 30 months of ELL instruction. And last year, um, there was a lot of um, activism and uh, and now, the, uh, unfortunately, the, the Latino and uh, Puerto Rican Affairs Commission is now defunct. They were one of the victims of the uh, budget issues in our state. Um, but they were really instrumental in getting increased um, time for kids who receive special, uh, who receive English language uh, learner support. Um, the way it works, you get the 30 months that is indicated in the statute uh, as of right and then you get 10 months extensions. The way those extensions work is really the school district has to petition the State Department of Education for those additional 10 months increments. So it's not really a right that uh, resides with the student or the parent. It's not the parent going to SDE and requesting additional 10 months. It's the school district requesting permission to have that child remain an additional 10 months. So it's a little bit sort of the you know, the, the, uh, it's sort of the fox guarding the, the hen house, if you think of it, right? Um, so hopefully, we, we don't know how that will work, um, but we're certainly um, watching the, the process. We're going to talk a little bit about students with um, special education needs. Um, the, and the statute that covers special education, it's called the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, or IDEA. Uh, the basics of IDEA is that schools are obligated to refer a student whose attendance, grades, or behavior are of concern to a planning and placement team meeting. This is called the Child Fine Statute. Um, services are up to the twin, 21 years of age. Uh, and what is special education? It means that it's a specially designed uh, program of instruction. It is offered at no cost to the parents or guardians to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 also comes in often, particularly for kids who may um, experience trauma, may have some anxiety, uh, you know, may, they may not meet the criteria for special education, but they may need uh, some accommodations for uh, a condition that significantly impairs a major life activity, and certainly trauma qualifies as that. Um, and so we've seen some instances where the child may not necessarily qualify for special education, but they may uh, qualify for accommodations pursuant to Section 504. So this is where I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about strategy and some legal strategies and some advocacy strategies when trying to parse out all these issues, right? So this is a scenario. You have a, a young person, and I'll talk to you about a particular 
uh, child that I represented. Uh, we One of the things that I do at the center is I uh, run a school-based legal clinic at uh, Harding High School in Bridgeport. Um, and I represented a young man who had come here from Guatemala. He was 15 when he arrived. Um, he had not been in school since the age of eight. Um, and he only, when he did go to school, um, was only sporadically because he had to work to uh, support his family. His mom died when he was 11 years old of cancer and he was left completely alone. He had no one in Guatemala. Um, so um, eventually, after a lot of really horrendous stuff that happened to him, um, he made the journey up to uh, to uh, the United States and had uh, some acquaintances in Bridgeport, some uh, distant relatives who um, agreed to, with the Office of Refugee Resettlement, to be their his sponsors. And so he was resettled with them. So he had not been in school. He had experienced a lot of trauma. Among many things, he actually saw um, or witnessed a very delayed uh, sort of agony of his mom dying, uh, almost around Christmas time. His mom dying of cancer and uh, refusing to go to sleep because she was afraid of leaving their children behind. And so that was very, very, very traumatizing, uh, being you know, persecuted and uh, not having anyone to care for his needs. Um, when Bridgeport, uh, and, you know, I'm try to not use the name of the school district, but you know, when the school district received uh, this child and enrolled him in school, um, it was sort of the question came up: Where do we place him? Because he had not been in school, perhaps in second grade, and um, when they did some testing, they figured that he could not really uh, read or write in his native language. So he was not proficient in Spanish. He had missed some really critical stages in terms of language acquisition. He had a lot of trauma history. Um, and um, the question was, can he learn? You know, is, is, is he, you know, so they placed him in ninth grade, right? So they went by their chronological age. That's what they did. They said, well, you're, you're 15. You should be in ninth grade. We can't really, we're at our loss. We, don't, we can't really bring you back all the way to sixth grade even. So we're going to put you in ninth grade. Um, when he started to struggle in school, they put him in a bilingual education class. Um, he started to struggle significantly. He was shut down. He put his head down. Uh, he was not acting out behavior, behaviorally. He was, um, he was really uh, an introvert. Um, and, 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 you know, really struggling emotionally in the classroom as well. So they refer him to special education testing. And the question came up, we can't figure out if this is his inability to learn or access the curriculum is on account of interrupted learning, a language deficit, or a disability. So it's sort of that perfect storm that I described in the beginning. Um, so, a couple things that we can do as advocates for, for our kids um, is start getting sort of chronological account of their academic experiences. Uh, if they're reporting any traumatic stress, right, we want to we wanna gather as much information as we can going into a meeting with the school. Uh, try to get school records from their countries of origin, which may be extremely difficult, right? Um, get if the school district or the, the receiving school district has done some um, language acquisition testing, get those scores, um, any previously uh, conducted evaluations, and most importantly, refer to the planning and placement team meeting. So what happens when you get to that stage, right? You, you sort of, you're getting into the testing stage um, is that question again. What evaluation should I request? Because it's, it's sort of what we need to figure out. What is the primary reason that this child is unable to learn? And it may be that the reason he can't learn is all three of them. It's language acquisition, it's probably a disability, and it's, you know, it's probably interrupted learning. And how do we differentiate and provide needs? My legal theory is that Interrupted learning does not excuse the district 
from providing services and meeting the needs of kids if they still have the disability and they also have a language learning this uh, need, spe specific language lear learning need. And we sort of have to emphasize, sort of bringing the team to the fact that, yes, he missed a lot of school, but we also have evidence here of uh, trauma. We also have evidence here of the fact that he may have other disabilities, learning disabilities, that we need to uh, capture. Some of the assessments, and, and this is sort of, and this is just a very shortened version of, of the strategy, and, and the handouts that we'll send to you uh, have a more uh, uh, complete least list of uh, tests that you should be requesting. Um, they should be, obviously, culturally, this is sort of uh, relates to the point, they should be in, 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 in their native language, and they should be culturally relevant and, and, uh, and sensitive to their needs. Um, so some of the tests that, that test, for example, uh, the intellectual quotient will be the test of number of intelligence. And so, again, in, this, in the handout that I'll provide to you, you'll have more detailed information. But it's important to sort of think about that, that we don't just throw our hands up in the air and say we, we don't know what to do, which is often what districts will do, and we'll try to say we've done everything we can, we can't do anything else, and sort of push back on the district and say, yes, there, yes, there are things that you can do. There's best practice models to meet those needs. And we'll talk about some of those in our round panel discussion. Very quickly, I'll just talk about uh, college resources for undocumented students. Um, actually, uh, Stefan and Connecticut Students for a Dream had a big role in doing this and pushing this through in 2011. Uh, and it's the uh, ability to get in-state tuition for undocumented students who meet all of these requirements. Um, and, I, and I know there's other legal advocacy strategies that we'll probably talk about later on. Um, in terms of Access to state and federal financial aid, the, the, quest, the answer is for undocumented kids, um, it's still not viable. There was some push this year, um, but didn't, 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 didn't go through. Um, Eastern Connecticut State University has a scholarship, but it's through the Dream US um, uh, organization, and the deadline was yesterday. Um, but hopefully people knew about this and, and they were able to, to apply. Some private colleges like Wesleyan have opened up the uh, ability for kids to um, get into the pool of applications. The Mexican American Legal Defense Fund puts together a great resource list every year uh, for scholarships for kids regardless of, of status. So we're going to move right into healthcare and my colleague Alex Rosenthal will be presenting. Thanks, Edwin. That was really great. Um, I mean, I think we can all agree that the three major areas that we all um, are important to all of us are our education, our furthering our education, but also our physical health and our emotional health. And when all three of those aren't working or we don't have access to those, um, children's health in particular can really decline and their long-term successful outcomes can be pretty poor. So I'm not going to talk for too long because there actually aren't a lot of options for access to health care um, for undocumented youth um, and families, but there are for other classifications of immigrant families, and so I'll just touch on them briefly, and then I brainstormed a little bit about some alternative um, and safety net programs that I'm sure a lot of you know, already know about, but we'll touch on those. And um, and then we can talk, I think it sort of would lead, leads in nicely to some of the advocacy work we all need to do around, um, around services for undocumented youth because sort of our, our federal policies and laws sort of ebb and flow and go up and down depending on the politics of the day, depending on um, the economy, depending on, you know, sort of the sensibilities of our country. But I work on our medical legal partnership at Yale New Haven Hospital, so I work closely with a lot of the providers, and we talk often about social determinants of health and how um, accessing services can impact your health in so many ways. And so many of the providers I work with feel so strongly about access to preventative health care and not just emergency health care and how that has um, 
it's really important for youth in particular. And so it's devastating. They see a family and they don't, they're undocumented and they can provide a certain amount of care depending on the parent's ability to pay. And then it past that, they can't, you know, refer them to the specialist or get their extra care that they, they need. So really quickly, I'll just talk about sort of access to health care. The overview is that, um, that your eligibility for emergency, you get emergency care regardless of your immigration and insurance status, um, and that, but that your access to state and federal benefits depends on immigration status. I'm not going to talk about benefits in general like food stamps and cash assistance and those programs, but those are also other benefits that your immigration status will depend on whether you are eligible for. So first, refugees. I think most of you know refugees are eligible for coverage um, under Husky and Medicaid. Husky in, here in Connecticut, as long as they meet the other eligibility criteria, so they still need to meet the financial eligibility criteria for Husky and Medicaid. Um, but they do, refugees do get refugee medical assistance for the first eight months in the U.S., regardless of their income. But after that eight months, they have to either qualify for Medicaid or get on to some other health insurance. Refugees do qualify for the Affordable Care Act, which is great, so they can pay into the exchanges if their, their job doesn't offer them health insurance. Um, and so there are some options for them in that sense. I just wanted to touch, I don't have a slide on it, but um, there are there are health coverages for other legal immigrants that we aren't talking about today, but I just wanted to say really quickly, in 2009 that there was a Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act um, which allowed um, young children and pregnant women access to non-emergency Medicaid and CHIP, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program in America. And they didn't have a five-year waiting period, so you could come and you'd have status, but you have to wait five years to show that you were here lawfully, um, and that no longer is in existence. And so but that, whether you qualify for that depends on a whole host of things about whether what your status is. And so um, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare delineated in 2010 in the letter and the guidance to all the states what lawfully present means. And so it has this really long list that I'm not going to bore you with today and real detail about your immigration status and about whether or not you qualify for um, CHIP for kids and for pregnant women. So um, that is an option for other families who are legal immigrants here that I just wanted to highlight really quickly. All right. So undocumented minors and their families are ineligible for most major federal funded insurance programs. And it's, when I first started this job, I was devastated to learn that. I was like, I can't believe there's kids out there that don't have health insurance. That's crazy to me. Um, and then I realized that, that getting the Affordable Care Act passed to even have people who are here was a ridiculous hurdle to cross. And so um, I, I get the politics behind it, but I think it's an advocacy point for us all to think about and talk about. Um, when you, you know, Edwin and I have a family that we've been working with where they cross the border from Guatemala and they both have this um, very severe bone disorder where they're crippled. And so they, but they can't access any health care here where you know that they can get a lot of help here in New Haven, but they aren't able to access it because of all these programs. And I just feel like they're the model of poster child for why we should pass reform to allow undocumented youth access to health care. Um, and then I also just found out that even though youth might be eligible for the Deferred Action and Childhood Arrivals, DACA, um, the... Um, CMS also issued guidance in 2012 saying that they are ineligible for Medicaid um, under the federal law, which is really too bad. So you say, you can come and work here, but we're not going to provide you health coverage, which is kind of, I think, an oxymoron there. Um, but they are eligible for emergency Medicaid to cover hospitalization for emergency medical treatment and, so, and for labor and delivery. So you can walk into the emergency room, um, and if you have a medical condition that requires immediate medical attention to stabilize you, then you can get um, services that way. So oftentimes families will use the emergency department to get access to some care for their children, especially if they're really sick. But we all know that emergency care is very expensive and it's a huge drain on the dollars of our healthcare system. And so again, I think it's also a good talking point about saying, look at all the dollars we would save if we provided preventative care or other types of free care for families so they didn't have to use the emergency room all the time. Um, let's see. So then 
And then the other really important thing about undocumented families is even if they can afford to pay into the exchanges under the Affordable Care Act, because of their unlawful status, they are not allowed to even pay into the system, which again, I think is a drain on our healthcare system. And access to, but you know, everybody knows that access to appropriate diagnostic treatment and regular primary care um, beyond emergency treatment is really critical, but is incredibly, incredibly limited. Um, so I, there are some alternatives, which you can call the safety net for our system. Access to pro bono or in-kind services are very limited, but there are free care programs providing no cost for hospital procedures and services at some hospitals. So um, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981 said that hospitals that are recognized as dis proportionate share hospitals with respect to the percentage of low-income and uninsured patients get additional payment from the federal government to support this uncompensated care. So I know I'm probably not supposed to say this on a webinar, but Yale New Haven Hospital has a free care program that they use, the funds that they get from the federal government, where you have to, if you're undocumented, you can, you have to go apply for, or you're uninsured in general, you don't have to just be undocumented. You have to prove that you went and tried to apply for health insurance, got denied, and once you have that denial, you can apply for free care up to six months, but that care only covers hospital services, so you can't go outside of the hospital to get other kinds of care, and even within the hospital, it only covers certain types of procedures and services within the hospital. And so our, met, our healthcare system is so complex, a lot of the specialty care that people have access to with insurance isn't, cover, isn't provided through the hospital. And so again, Edwin and I's patient has free care, but they can't access the orthopedic services that they need for their bones because it's outside the hospital. So there are some safety nets there for the free care programs. It's not just Yale, there are other hospitals that also provide these services. Then there's sliding scale services, where, but again, you have to show proof of income. And often this is hard because a lot of undocumented families don't have proof of their income because they work under the table. So um, it's a pretty stringent rule and it makes it hard to access those services. But one thing that um, my colleague Danielle and I thought about was school-based health centers are a really critical and wonderful resource for a lot of these youth because they don't question their immigration status um, and they are able to actually get primary care services there, which is great. Again, they can't get specialty care, but a lot of the basic preventive health care that I think is really critical to, to children's out good health outcomes can happen at the school-based health centers. And in addition, I love school-based health centers because they provide sort of wraparound services for youth, right? They walk in the door, they have their education, they have their health, and they even most school-based health centers have social workers so they can get their mental health as well, um, all in one nice package. And they're just really nice people. <laughs> and they'll do a lot of advocacy with the school for the kids. And then the last is federally qualified health centers, which I'm sure you all know. We have two here in the um, New Haven area. Um, there's there's federally qualified health centers across the country, and they are provided funding from the federal government to provide care regardless of your ability to pay your insurance status or your immigration status, um, but they also have a sliding scale fee, and so you have to show your proof of income um, there. And I just wanted to also note here in New Haven, I'm sure you all know this, but it, the um, Fairhaven Clinic has a free clinic on um, Saturday mornings that's run through the Yale School of Medicine where the medical students volunteer to see undocumented families who can't afford to even pay the sliding scale or even access services. Um, it's mostly for adults, it's not for children, but it's a great service for them. And they also have connected with the Yale Law School to provide um, legal services for those families. So they do sort of a legal screen and a health screen for families. Um, it's really great. And in my last 30 seconds, I just wanted to point out medical interpretation because I, I know it's a simple thing, but um, your access to healthcare isn't just about whether you have insurance, but it's about whether you can communicate with your doctor. So it's one thing to say, where's the bathroom or, you know, how do I get to the McDonald's or whatever it is you need to communicate, but communicating about your healthcare is really complicated and without having an appropriate interpreter to be able to communicate between you and your doctor um, is really critical. But the Civil Rights Act of 1964 covers the, um, that hospitals that receive, or any kind of clinic that receives federal funding has to have a system in place to support limited English proficient um, families and, and anyone. And so this four-factor balancing test talks about who would actually have to do that. So not every clinic that gets federal funding and not every um, place would have to do that. 
and they don't have to provide an interpreter. It can have just bilingual staff. They can do phone lines, and they can encourage people to bring family members. So it's not required that they have, unless it's Yale New Haven Hospital, we are required to have interpreters. <laughs> and we have a wonderful interpretation staff at Yale New Haven Hospital. They're not only interpreters, but advocates for a lot of the families that they work with, which is really great. So in summary, refugees eligible for almost about anything, legal, immigrants, same, and undocumented, nothing. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Edwin. Oh, sorry, last one. We have a really awesome guide to healthcare rights um, for teens um, that talks about all the different um, rules and regulations around healthcare access for youth. So the time now is about 10 o'clock, and we started a little late, um, but um, hopefully we have about half an hour, 40 minutes if people um, don't mind staying a little longer um, just to go over the round panel discussion. So we're going to go, go uh, jump right in, um, and our presenters did introduce themselves right at the beginning, um, and hopefully uh, as people start talking, if you just want to you know, say your, your, your name again, just your first name so people know. Who, who's speaking um, as, as you're uh, making comments, et cetera, that would be great. So we're going to start with um, the first question. We have about five questions that we want to uh, sort of frame the discussion around. And the first question is really, you know, what are the needs of undocumented and refugee children in New Haven uh, with regards to education, access to health, and mental health? Um, so I'm going to use the same example that I um, talked about earlier on. Uh, the client, the 15-year-old client from Guatemala, who I represented uh, at Harding. Um, one of the things that um, was very clear to me uh, very early on, not, not only that he had a lot of education issues that he was struggling with, but also health care issues. Um, so at one point, he's actually sitting in my office, and we're trying to go over some really traumatic stuff in order to prepare a petition for court so that he could remain here lawfully. Um, and he seemed really, um, really in discomfort uh, and, and in pain. And I assume it had to do with him relating the story. I mean, it's not uncommon when you're talking about trauma that obviously is going to bring uh, forth a lot of pain and, and, and you might want to disconnect from what's being related. Um, it was as simple as the fact that he had um, he was experiencing some tooth pain. He he was in a lot of pain, and he had not been be, you know been able to sleep for days. Uh, he had not access to simple things as just Tylenol. Um, so, um, as Alice said, uh, the 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 sort of first thing that we could do is I immediately walk with him to the school-based health clinic at Harding, who happens to have uh, great staff, very supportive staff, so that he could access dental care. Um, so I'm wondering if people can talk about their experiences or what they're seeing on the ground in terms of unmet needs, things that you see sort of prominent uh, that are happening. And what we're doing is, as the discussion is going along, um, um, Alice will be taking some notes and also uh, we're, we're typing the notes and we will be sending them along uh, at the end of the discussion with the uh, PowerPoint slides. So whoever wants to start. Um, Great. Hello again, Caprice with the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. I just wanted to importantly put this into context so that we have um, recently in the news unaccompanied minors, refugees, uh, immigrants, and documented immigrants coming here, specifically Connecticut, specifically New Haven as part of the conversation today. Um, but when we look at what is happening in Central America, we can't untie it from what the U.S. policies have been. So my perspective, it's our responsibility to take care of these children, not just, um, you know, doing the right thing or wanting to help poor people, quote unquote. But when you have U.S. foreign policies that have uh, trained uh, two, over 200,000 par paramilitary army folks in Guatemala to not just be uh, military, but to torture people um, by the U.S., written training manual, written by the U.S. from the School of the Americas. These concepts um, come and hit the ground here in New Haven. And this didn't happen that long ago. So in 1996 was when there was a four-signed peace accord for the Central American Free Trade Agreement 
that decimated jobs in the agricultural sector. So once again, the very people that were hurt by these 200,000 paramilitary folks then did not have a way to survive and feed their children. These are the children. This was less than 20, 26 years ago, the peace accord was signed. What that did was over 200,000 people were unemployed, trained killers in 1996. And some of them still had their weapons in hand. Then you have the drug policies that have not helped Latin America and haven't changed anything, but militarized the zone even more. And you have children fleeing drug lords coming here to New Haven. All these things have equate equal to a child coming here traumatized, a child coming here fleeing for their lives or parents saying, you know, you need to go up north because we can't save you here. So that I just wanted to put that into context. And so what we have are school teachers, healthcare providers, advocates, um, all wanting to help, but we don't know what to do. So, um, but I wanted to put it into context because what we're doing is actually trying to uh, bring justice back into inhumane situations that people are fleeing. Thank you. Excellent point. Just uh, kind of from my perspective, so coming from a, a legal service program, right, so, uh, you know, our staff is not directly addressing um, barriers to accessing education and, and health services and, and mental health services, but we regularly encounter those issues, right, because our clients need, you know, we're trying to work with them, do our best to zealously advocate for whatever immigration relief we can, but how can you work with someone in front of you who, like you said, has a toothache or didn't sleep the last couple of nights because they're reliving that trauma? I mean, that gets very challenging. And then th the other issue, again, from my perspective, is that permeating all of this is this ever-present fear of deportation, of being sent back to that life that they just fled, that you know that they, they chose to make or their parents chose to have them make that horrifying journey here because somehow that would be better than, than home. And so the entire time they're having to go to court, you know, children uh, and, and see a judge and, um, and, and encounter a, you know, a, a government attorney who's trying to deport them um, without access to, in many cases, free or affordable legal counsel or, or even good legal counsel. Um, and so again, just another sort of ever present challenge that complicates all of the all of those things. Thank you, Alicia. Maria. Thank you. I think Apris that you're very right when you said that there are many people willing to help. There are so many wonderful organizations that are willing to help, but I think that the organizations are not properly um, educated and we don't know what you said we don't know what to do oftentimes and in addition to that we don't have enough resources to be able to do things right um, having said that um, there are many differences between how things work in cities or towns um, i come from a smaller town where the latino population is smaller um, we all illegal immigration is the big elephant in the room that we all know that is there but nobody talks about and actually that sometimes can be a good thing because it um, it, 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 it prevents the possibility of closing doors um, for needs, very important needs for our children. Um, schools, uh, the school system um, has done tremendous improvements in the past few years. But as you were talking about an example in Bridgeport, you have some schools that are better than others. I do think that we lack um, of um, bilingual, bicultural person, staff that is really is willing to really to be able to um, respond to the needs of the community. Um, no offense to non-bilingual, no bicultural people, they have their best interest and their best intentions oftentimes, but is not the, 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 the best help that our children can, can have. Ment a 
health care and mental health services is, is, is terrible. I mean, we have wonderful band-aids, and that's the only thing that we have. We have wonderful resources, but they're, they're just band-aids. When the real, when the needs are, are real, and, and, and they, they call for um, very specific um, treatments, that is absolutely non-existent for our children, and that is, is very scary. Another thing that I think that is very important to keep in mind and that's something that we all do and that we need to continue working towards is, is create an environment where children feel welcome. That is very powerful. And also where they feel proud of who they are and where they come from because that is key for them to, to move up and, and to succeed. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is Megan from Ula. Um, I think that you did a great job um, summarizing some of the issues that these young people face, um, getting health care, like you said. What I see a lot is that the primary care is, you can get the primary care, but it's much harder to get the specialists and the dental care that these children need. Um, I would just add that in terms of the needs of these children, um, many undocumented children are working in Connecticut. And these are often the teenagers and children who are sort of under, under the radar screen, who don't have lawyers, who are not connected. But I think that it's important to keep that in mind. And even some of the teenagers who are part of ULA who have lawyers and who have support to fight their deportation case, they go to high school and then they go to work and they really don't have time to do homework and they have an amazing opportunity maybe to have a life that's different from um, other undocumented children if they win their deportation case, but they're working. So when we think about the needs of these children, we can also be thinking about uh, labor rights, raising the minimum wage, you know, looking at these exploitation jobs that children are working in. Um, another thing that came to mind when we were talking about education, um, here in New Haven, m most of the um, immigrant children at ULA are from Guatemala, and many of them speak indigenous languages, or their parents speak indigenous languages as their first language, um, Kachikel, Kiche, and Mam. And there's no awareness in the schools or in the broader community that we have indigenous Guatemalans here. We have some indigenous Mexicans. So I just echo this point of we need to build a greater understanding of uh, where people are coming from, deepen those connections of the immigrants here with the cultures, um, that their home cultures and their home communities, and build a greater understanding of the history that people are coming from. Are great points. Thank you. Hi, this is Tanya from Iris. And touching on some of what's been said uh, and going back to a little bit of talk about the school-based health centers, which are amazing. They do great work. They care deeply for, them, for their students. Um, they have a, a form that students, uh, families have to fill out to register. And there's a question on that form. Uh, has your child experienced a traumatic event in the past year, um, death of a loved one, uh, a move? And in the past five years that I've been in this work, 100% of parents answer that question, no. So I think, you know, in terms of accessing care, um, there are a number of barriers to speak to, and one of them certainly is a little bit of what um, Megan from ULA spoke spoke of. Um, you know, parents are are dealing with with their own trauma, and sometimes recognizing that their children are are having similar struggles, um, and being able to 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 reach out for care for their children when they're just trying to meet basic daily survival needs is is a chore. And then there's the also, also uh, the stigma that's associated with mental health needs, which we see a lot of. So if, if the family is, is willing and able to reach out for, for care for their children, there is the additional barrier of school-based health centers, with, which often don't have um, in their, with their social worker a language line. Um, 
that. And oftentimes, as I think uh, other people have mentioned, um, there may not be culturally competent experts in the school building who can um, ad address problems that students might be having. Um, I, I everybody knows sometimes trauma can, can manifest as bad behavior in kids. So kids who might be acting out during the school day might be receiving inappropriate um, disciplinary actions rather than being pulled aside and saying, and, you know, being spoken to about uh, mental health needs they might be facing. Thanks. Um, Caprice with the Community Foundation. Um, I also wanted to go back to education. Oftentimes, um, having a student um, showing that they are ELL or having trauma or that they're a recent immigrant are all reasons as to why traditional school systems say we can't teach them. We, we'll do the best we can. And the, uh, one of the responses in one of the school districts, the Boston Public School District, advocates, including myself, said no. There are other places that they know how to reframe, restructure a high school even to help students uh, perform well. And so a group of us went and visited a, new, um, a school in New York and another area. And then we developed uh, the Boston International High School. And one of the key components was not saying to a recent immigrant, you need to uh, learn English, acquire a mastery of all these other subject matters, and pass the high stakes standardized test in four years. We pushed to get it to five year high school. And you do not age out. So when you hit 18, you still have access to that education. Um, the, the very first three years of the school, the students outperformed a good number of the regular uh, public schools, high school students, outperformed in math um, and in other areas. With the right support system, it can happen. So it's a matter of will a school district, will a state uh, board of education have the will to want to create a structure that truly supports the needs of these students? This is Kim Dears Daly from Clifford Beers and the Trauma Coalition. Um, I, I really appreciate just all the thoughts in the room and certainly regarding our school-based health clinics, which we're a part of. Um, for us, you know, the Trauma Coalition is, is really um, relying on our community to provide support for children um, that is not based on, you know, insurance requirements or being part of, um, you know, programs that require a monetary um, funding, but really bring supports for all kids that don't require that. And, um, you know, in regards to trauma, it's really about not just, you know, so you're here and you've come from somewhere, but also what was the journey um, that brought you here? And so we really are trying to make schools you know, trauma-informed, but then also culturally informed. So not just, you know, what happened when you were there and in the country that you came from, but what was your journey here and what has been told to you since you have come here? And, you know, the amount of loss that occurs in each of those stages and that those phases of uh, coming to the country is just immense. And so really making teachers, you know, our security officers in our schools, our principals, anybody who really has access to our children and families, communicating the same message around, you know, given the losses that you've been through, there is support um, and we are going to find that for you. We really try and pair um, our mental health support with basic needs support. If we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people cannot access higher level, you know, um, support if they don't even have food, if they don't have a bed to sleep on, if they don't have, you know, somebody helping them translate their needs um, in a way that is uh, supportive to them. So we really take a look at what is the need of the family? Can we help them? Uh, can we look at public health support? to really communicate and destigmatize, um, you know, trauma treatment and, and basic needs support saying, you know, we are all in need and how can we help each other? Um, so that's just a, a few things that we're trying to do. Um, if I can, so this is Alicia, uh, again, from the International Institute. Um, Kimberly, you talked about the journey coming over and um, I think that's so important. Um, uh, we have an unaccompanied, as I stated before, an unaccompanied minor program 
at our organization, but we also have a partially federally funded anti-trafficking program, and so as a result, all of our attorneys, when they do screenings, especially with vulnerable populations like unaccompanied minors, are screening for trafficking, um, and Daniela knows this, I mean, we see um, really uh, grossly disproportionate amount of trafficking victims among unaccompanied minors. Um, victims of trafficking either in their home country and it led to part of the, you know, part of their reason of why they came here. Um, an extremely high number of individuals trafficked en route to the U.S., forced to carry drugs in, forced to work in stash houses, performing commercial sexual acts, uh, cooking, cleaning, and doing a variety of other tasks, but also once they've gotten here in the U.S., um, because sometimes the sponsor who's available is not the sponsor that anyone would really want and isn't a family member, has pretended to be a family member, is next of kin, the next cousin, um, but isn't the guy or gal who should be with that child. And so... Um, it's 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 terribly frightening. The risk level is extremely high, and so you know I was you talked about the the numbers of enrollment versus the numbers of children, and so that you know ninety percent sounds great, but what about the ten percent? Right? What about those one thousand children who are, for all intents and purposes, missing? Right? Um, missing uh, with people who, who may or may not be doing the best they can to provide for them, um, not speaking English, not knowing how to, to ask for or receive appropriate help, um, probably uh, would e wouldn't even if they could because they're coming from a place where law enforcement doesn't help. They're the ones committing the crime or are often complicit with the commission of crimes. Um, and so uh, just Again, another factor to consider that th these youth are at such high risk to all sorts of exploitation, but especially trafficking, and, and including those who, many of my clients who are 17, 16 and 17 are being told as they try to enroll in school that they can only go to the night school, you know, that they don't have enough English, that's the only option, and they don't know to fight that. And so they do, and then they start working during the day, and they're working hard-working, low-paying jobs. Not that that means you are a victim of trafficking, but if you're in that kind of position where you're working to live and you're working long, long hours and a hard job, you are vulnerable to exploitation, and that exploitation can and often does rise to the level of trafficking. So I have one more uh, from Daniela. Hi, so this is Daniela. Um, I have the great pleasure to work for two nonprofits um, where, you know, Edwin and Alice are my colleagues at CCA and Alicia is my colleague at ICON. At ICON, I'm a caseworker for undocumented minors, so I'm tasked with receiving the referrals from ORR and then making home visits to make sure that these sponsors and the minors are getting along and helping them locate services in the community, clinics, what schools they should enroll in. Um, and one of my biggest hard hardships is that what I think is a gross oversight on ORR's part is that these sponsors have to meet with me on a voluntary basis. And my job is to do three visits to the home. And any time a sponsor can call me and say, stop coming to my house, don't visit me, we don't want to see you. And it's happened so many times where sometimes if they say, you know, the sponsors themselves are undocumented, they're like, I work, I can't just take time out of my day, I go home at 6 o'clock. So unless you want to come visit me at 6 o'clock, don't come to my house. Or other times I'll do one visit and I'll notice something's off, and then when I try to schedule a second visit, the sponsor's like, yeah, no, I don't want you to come to my house. And there's nothing that I can do because their sponsorship is voluntary. So there's nothing in that contract when ORR releases these minors to these sponsors that say you have to let, you know, you have to comply with these number of visits. So after the first visit or before we even get into the door the first time, these sponsors can tell me, don't come to my house, don't call me and I can't do anything about it. And so, you know, it, it puts me as a community worker who's trying to support this minor, and then I'm left thinking, okay, now do I have a possible case of abuse? Is something going on? Like, what's really going on with this minor behind these closed doors? Um, and that's just something I wanted to touch up on because it makes it hard for me to then do my job, right? To connect um, the minor and the sponsor with the services that they need. And oftentimes these sponsors, uh, work really hard and some are really great um, and often it's a mom or dad but then you get one where it's a 19 year old cousin who like doesn't know where 
to take the minor to a clinic. And then it makes it really hard as a community provider to offer these support services. And so I just wanted to touch on that because I think it's a really gross oversight on behalf of ORR, especially like Alicia said, they are minors who are being literally released into the hands of traffickers and people who will exploit them and abuse them. And it makes it really hard for a community provider such as myself to go out and then try to see which minors are the ones that are the most vulnerable. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. I'm going to address that very briefly. Um, I think that you bring up a really um, important point, and I just want to remind people, obviously, that um, you know, if, depending on your role, you may be a mandated reporter under state law, um, and you may have to report to the Department of Children and Families. That is quite is sort of a challenging situation because if, in fact, you're reporting a family that um, it is the only resource for this child, and there's nothing really going on except that they are working. In fact, they're way too uh, stretched out. Then you're jeopardizing that placement. So it's a, it's a tough call, and I appreciate that. There's been a lot of great ideas that have been put forth uh, already. So we're going to move right to the next question. Um, so the next question is, you know, I guess, what are some of the challenges, challenges in meeting those needs? Uh, and are there any gaps in accessing services? And I think we've in large part address that question. I think we got it right into the discussion. Uh, except, does anyone want to um, sort of talk additionally, an additional point that you want to make regarding that point? Well, whether it's an undocumented minor or undocumented adult, we also have um, the issue with notarios, notaries that are scamming our community and um, charging outrageous amounts promising people that they will change their immigration status for them and then they get deported. Um, and we're talking about $2,000 out of someone who makes every uh, dollar delivering uh, sandwiches and saves, you know, for forever to be able to pay those $2,000 and then they get deported. So that's happening in New Haven and I met someone like that in the elevator who paid $2,000. Um, uh, in, um, in Connecticut, we just, uh, with the support of International Institute of Connecticut and Alicia, thank you so much for making it happen, we did a Board of Immigration Appeals training to increase the number of BIA representatives who um, are certified, who will be accredited to be able to pr provide these types of services, and they need to be working with an institution that is recognized by the Board of Immigration Appeals and Spanish Community of Wallingford um, is going through that process now to become an additional resource along with the International Institute of Connecticut and Junta. So we ask uh, people to tell, to become informed where are these Board of Immigration Appeals accredited folks, including um, Unidad Latina and Acción actually have volunteers who are immigrants themselves who are going through the Board of Immigration Appeals training uh, certification. Hopefully, we'll we'll get 15 more that pass the exam this week. <laughs> and so, um, there are resources out there. We're very um, uh, aware of the scam artists that are out there, and we encourage people to look at the various community foundation websites that are part of the collaborative. We will have listings of where people can go and not get scammed for support for immigration status questions. Thank you, Caprice. Maria? I do have to say that some of the challenges oftentimes is also our own community. I do understand that our community face too many challenges. They need to work. They need to um, provide for their families. But it is very important that we have candid conversations with our community to understand the importance of them learning English. Um, they're a, a getting educated about all of these issues, particularly the one in immigration. Oftentimes, they go and they talk with an, with, with an attorney that tell them you do not have a case. So they go and talk until they find the person that will tell them that they do have a case. So it is important that sometimes there are difficult conversations to have and sometimes it is difficult, but we need to really push our community to um, open their eyes and to educate themselves and to to prevent all of these scams and to and to put themselves in a better situation.
And in line with that, um, helping them recognize they're not alone. And with uh, people power coming together, there are opportunities to change things, including challenging a school that refuses to provide services, but talking amongst others who are going through the same thing and coming together as a collective, not as individuals solely, because then it's easy for a system to say no. And so um, I think the hope for a lot of these issues, the heart of it is really our organizing, mobilizing groups that are here at the table as well, such as Unidad Latina Acción, Kinetic Students for a Dream, and others who are saying we can't um, stand by and let this continue in the way it is because it's hurting a lot of families, hurting a lot of children. And we're not just talking undocumented, we're talking about including mis mixed status families where you may have um, children who are U.S. born who are not accessing these healthcare systems that they have the right to because the parents are undocumented. Or you might have one parent who's undocumented the other one who is documented, and currently in the state of Connecticut, uh, probation, foster care, et cetera, they do not have full awareness of what immigration laws are. And I've spoken to an officer who stated, um, the mother is the one who's abusing the children, and I've worked on this case for family here in New Haven even for 10 years. And I don't know how to help them because I don't know the immigration implications. And the dad is afraid that if he gets deported, what will happen to his kids? And the mother threatens him with deportation. So here you have a whole other system in Connecticut uh, and, and uh, well-intended workers for the state, but not knowing the ins and outs of immigration and how to advocate. So the dad could actually qualify for U visa. He is physically abused by the mother. Um, and that would support him. And so um, she was one of the individuals that came through our training, the Board of Immigration Appeals, and we'll use that knowledge now to protect children. But I think um, also for other individuals who do work with these families to become aware of what immigration law entails or find resources where they can go to and find information because it is hurting families, this broken immigration system. Thank you, Caprice. Yeah. Um, this is Alicia again, and I have to leave in a minute. So I just wanted to say one thing, and then you triggered a thought, which is um, that case, and in general, right, being told I'm going to deport you and keep your US citizen children, that is abuse, right? You don't need the physical part. That's sufficient, right? That's coercion. That's threatening. That, that is sufficient. So yeah, physical abuse can, can get you there, but, but you don't need it, right? Uh, it's another form of domestic violence that could qualify you for immigration relief like a, like a U visa. But um, one last point I wanted to bring up, like increasing the amount of BIA accredited representatives in Connecticut is phenomenal. Increasing the, increasing the capacity of organizations like ourselves and other to do work, um, to do legal immigration work is, 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 is so vital, but also we need to do a better job of tapping into private attorneys uh, and law firms and pro bono attorneys in Connecticut because like even in an organization like ourselves, it's been around for decades and doing this work and we charge fees that we, um, that we try to cover most of the service costs because it's hard um, to get outside funding for undocumented immigrants, just a fact. Um, even with that, we don't have the resources to do nearly enough. And in most cases, these removal cases are long, they're costly, they're among the most resource intensive, and, and you know, individual nonprofit organizations and BIA reps and attorneys at those organizations can only take a few, right? We can only take a, a handful a year. Same thing like, you know, the Yale Clinic does a wonderful job, but same thing. They can only take a handful a year. And we're talking about, you know, many more than a handful every single day. Who need who need legal assistance, and so um, and and there are lots of private attorneys and small firms and and large firms, especially in New Haven, who do a tremendous amount of pro bono work. Um, but I think we have to be find more ways to to leverage that to be more creative, especially tapping into young and and vibrant and motivated new attorneys without immigration experience who uh, would be willing and it, it would be beneficial to their future careers to. To learn about more about immigration and and 
and, send, and, and hopefully use some of their time to help support this population. Thanks. That's a great point. I, I echo that point. We, we uh, at the center, we started a pro bono project uh, regards to uh, kids who are abused, abandoned, or neglected who qualify for special immigrant juvenile status. And we had about 42 attorneys that attending the training here in New Haven um, and have served uh, kids from uh, New Haven, but also Fairfield County and other parts of the state. Uh, and we will begin another um, uh, pilot program in Hartford and uh, east of the river. So that will be something that we, we, we're looking to, to expand. Um, so um, any last comments, questions, or should we move ahead? Okay, great. Um, so um, I think we've covered a lot of big ideas so far as well, but I'm wondering if there's any other people want to add in terms of big ideas, right? And, uh, okay. Um, so just talking about... Um, yeah, big ideas to address what um, immigrant children are facing in Connecticut. Um, a big idea at ULA is not one more deportation. And um, we stand for stopping all deportations, and that includes people who qualify for certain forms of relief and people who do not qualify. And um, we also stand for stopping the raids. Um, and one thing that I would like to see us mobilizing around more in Connecticut or starting to mobilize around is um, lift, uh, raising the cap on visas for special, uh, for special immigrant juveniles. Um, there's a limited number of visas that are given out to abandoned and abused immigrant children. Um, the cap has been reached for Central American children. They're just not giving out more of those visas this year, right, Edwin? I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, um, but this is what my colleagues at Esperanza Law Center are talking about. And so we wanna make some noise um, about this um, with our Congress people, with our senators, about how there are many more um, abandoned and abused immigrant children than there are visas available. And what's, what's happening is that um, because these visas are no longer available, um, many of these juveniles, the immigration court is uh, reopening their cases. And if the, the young people are not in contact with their lawyer or they haven't submitted their change of address form, they're going to get a deportation order in absentia, you know, not showing up to court. And we're seeing the Obama administration, um, you know, aggressively raiding homes and communities to deport these children and, and moms, mostly, um, who, for whatever reason, they haven't gotten a lawyer, they haven't showed up to court. Um, because they've fallen through the cracks, because they haven't gotten access to those services. So, um, you know, there's a movement in Connecticut to stop these raids. There's a movement to, to say not one more deportation. Um, but I really think that we can start making some noise about how there are, uh, we need to get more of these visas available to children. Um, other, other things that we do to, um, to empower this community is at ULA we have um, we try to pair each immigrant child with a with a volunteer or sometimes with a church who would support that child or that family and that's something that Iris does too and that we sort of learn from Iris um, because we don't have uh, <laughs> social workers or or official social services for these families, but there are volunteers and there are congregations that can be paired up with these folks and take them to the health centers. We even um, take people to court, and that is actually really important so that they don't feel alone, so that when they're going to court, they feel supported. Um, they have people in the courtroom who kind of have their backs. Um, and that has worked very well. And then the other thing we do at ULA is that we have a community meeting every Monday. And so our families come together and they share ideas with each other. And that is hugely important because often undocumented immigrants know a lot more about where to get healthcare services than I do. 
because they find ways. And then they share knowledge with each other and they build knowledge with each other. And someone says, oh, I went to this health center and I couldn't get services. And somebody else says, oh, you should try that dentist. You should try that health center. This is what I did. I'll take you. And so we build that power collectively, like Caprice was saying. And the other uh, big idea or strategy that I would share is telling our stories in a public way. So um, these immigrant children have met with Governor Malloy when he didn't want more immigrant children coming to Connecticut. Um, they had a meeting with him. Um, some of these immigrant children have, you know, rallied with Mayor Harp and our police chief to say stop the raids. Um, they have spoken with journalists and told a bit of their stories, whatever part of their stories they're willing to share. And the more that we can get these stories told, the more we can create an environment in Connecticut that's more welcoming to them. Um, this, this, these young people who have the bone disease, who can't get health care, that's a story that can be told. And there are certain journalists who are more sympathetic to these causes who can tell the story in a way that really mobilizes people. There are many doctors who would probably be willing to donate their services or people who would be willing to get mobilized if we can get these stories out into the media and into the public sphere. Those are great. Awesome ideas. Um, I want to uh, address something very quickly about the uh, special immigrant juvenile status visa. You're absolutely correct, right? The number of visas has been met for the first time in history. Uh, historically, there's the U.S. government uh, since 1990, when special immigrant juvenile status uh, became um, available, has been providing 10,000 visas per year. Uh, in fiscal year, I think 20. 14, the number of visas that was granted was about hovering around 7,000 or so. Uh, and this year, for the first time before the end of the fiscal year, that number was met, that cap was met for 10,000. And it impacts particularly uh, three countries in Central America, one of them being Guatemala. Um, and so what is being said is there's a lot of uncertainty regarding uh, what is the best strategy to protect kids who are still, who may have gone through the first process of getting the uh, visa protection, which is going through the state court and getting the findings that are necessary to apply for the benefit. Um, and then what happens if um, you don't get the visa and, you, and you're still in that status? There's there's some still some um, work that needs to happen to figure that out in the meantime. But the idea of asking our government to increase that number um, because of the uh, humanitarian crisis is absolutely necessary. That's something that we should all rally around. So, uh, Estefan, you wanted to, to touch. Um, thank you. This is Stefan from Connecticut Students for a Dream. I'm not going to I'll just speak for a little bit because Megan actually mentioned a lot of what I was going to say in being, I think, kind of the grassroots group representation at the table um, about kind of like a way that we're going to solve a lot of these big issues, kind of like labor rights, education for undocumented youth is the power from the community. And I think that what Connecticut Students for a Dream has done has shown that. I think that when kind of the Trust Act passed that allowed uh, for some um, protections and police not cooperating with ICE, that happened because undocumented folks went to the Capitol and, and told their stories at public hearings. The driver's licenses that passed for undocumented folks, a thousand people showed up at a, uh, a public hearing then. For um, in-state tuition for undocumented folks, 50 students told their stories and legislators told us that was the first time we've actually heard or seen someone undocumented. That's probably not true, let's be honest. but. That is kind of like the the kind of like running mentality and things and how folks describe this. So I think that is like one of the the biggest ways we're going to deal with some of these big issues is kind of like hearing from the community and providing those pathways to leadership. Because I don't think also we can expect folks to just kind of come out of the woodwork right away. Right? There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of fear. So the question also is being proactive. We do a lot of work with schools with the College Access Program, and one of the things we do is saying, you know, I do a lot of like hour trainings, which is a great start. But we're also looking at our national organization, United We Dream, has like a four-hour training model where you really go deep into what is the trauma? What is the mental health needs? What is the history of immigration in our country? Because I think without that understanding, you can provide services. And what I see in schools, I go into a lot of schools that have a decent amount of services. But if the understanding is not there, students will still feel that they are not welcome and they're not accepted because true welcoming is kind of like, what does the curriculum of a school look like? 
I remember when I was taught about immigration, I didn't learn anything about kind of the immigration policies that Kedekin Susur Dream has taught me. So I think it's really looking at, if we want people to access services, if we want schools to be welcoming, we need staff and we need everyone to have a deep understanding, being proactive, and then providing those pathways for the actual community and undocumented folks to then take the reins and leadership and say, these are the needs of our community, these are how we're going to fight for them, and these are what some of the options are. So I really hope that folks will, you know, connect with groups and fo local folks in the community. And there's a lot of great resources represented around the table. Um, but I think it's that really deep connection and that that voice and then figuring out together how do we work on these things is really going to push some of these ideas forward. Thank you, Stefan. Hi, this is Tanya from IRIS again. Um, three things I just wanted to mention super quick. Uh, at IRIS, we have uh, a refugee leader group that we've developed over the past maybe year and a half. And it's a group of refugees um, who represent every country from which refugees um, have joined us, and uh, both genders. And um, they're responsible for every step of the process in helping refugees from the day they arrive. They, we have a representative um, from their culture meet them at, at the train station um, or the airport. And they also may be involved in cooking the welcome meal. Um, they exchange contact information. And uh, this refugee leader is a, a touchstone for this person from the day they arrive as long as they need. And it's so uh, important to have uh, their, their support because they've been through it. They know the process. They know um, what, what obstacles clients might encounter as, as they're going along on their journey. So that's a, a big idea that's really working out well for us. And we're actually in the process of de developing a refugee youth leadership group who can uh, offer the same kind of support for kids. Uh, another thing I just wanted to say, maybe to echo what's already been said, is that I think we need to make more of a push to find pro bono support because I know, as already has been said again, I'm, I'm calling Alice every day, almost every day, a couple times a week. Um, and, and of course, uh, Alice and everybody else, Icon, who does fantastic work and who we refer so many clients to, um, we have an immigration attorney who, uh, you know, she can only do so much. Um, there's only so much that can be done with, with the support that we have. So we need to make more of a push to find um, people who are just entering the field, pro bono support. Um, yeah. And also, I just wanted to throw out there bricks.org. It's Bridging Refugee Youth and Children's Services. I think that's it. But it's a great site for all things um, related to refugee youth, not just refugees, but, but immigrants, uh, all uh, kinds of immigrants. It's a great clearinghouse for information if you're looking for best practices, things, big ideas that other people are doing. Um, I'm, I'm on their site uh, every week at least a few times just looking for ideas, uh, especially if I'm struggling with something, just to see uh, what other people are doing. Thanks. Um, and I do want to mention uh, CIRA, Connecticut has an immigrant rights coalition that's statewide and many of the people around the table are also part of their founding members. Thank you, Megan, for being one of the founding members of CIRA. <laughs> and uh, Stefan and, and uh, CIRA is trying to bring about, you know, uh, collective power for change, for policy change, policy reform. And so encouraging people who are part of this webinar to um, engage with a local immigrant rights group um, and explore joining CIRA to increase that collective power. Um, there's also trainings that are going on. There's one coming up on Saturday, June 18th to become more informed around DACA, DAPA, if the extension should see the light of day, to be well informed on that as well. And the training is actually on how to facilitate a DACA, DAPA clinic, uh, checking eligibility requirements, uh, supporting people through that. But more importantly, I would say, there's a component on know your rights, regardless of your immigration status. What are your rights um, if I should approach you, et cetera? Um, and then more importantly than that is trying to um, 
welcome people to be part of a mobilized effort to continue fighting for immigrant rights. As long as the immigration system is broken, we have to continue that fight, and it's with people power. So um, I would encourage in, in all those fronts uh, to get engaged. And then I do want to mention the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. We're fortunate to also support other groups that are doing work in this area. Apostle Immigrant Services is one, for example. And when I think of uh, Sister Mary Allen, I also think of um, the work that she does and how uh, individuals from the state call her um, uh, when they have cases. And they don't have someone currently at the state who is an immigration attorney full time. And that is not um, meeting the Constitution here in Connecticut. So um, uh, that's another area that advocacy can support. Um, uh, I would also like to mention um, if people don't have time, but they have money to donate. <laughs> to some of the groups around this table who are doing great work, including um, others like Elm City International. They support uh, literacy um, achievement for students, primarily immigrant and refugee students, through soccer as well. And uh, they have a strong college access um, uh, going rate as well as retention rate graduating from college. Um, so they have a really unique, beautiful model. And um, New Haven Legal Assistance is another group that um, we work with. And Plant Parenthood, when we talk about um, access to free health care, uh, Plant Parenthood in uh, New Haven is one of the few uh, free resources, but primarily around reproductive health. Oh, it's not free? Ah, that's good to know. <laughs> Thank you, Caprice. The great points. And Natalia, you wanted to? Um, I was on the board of directors for CCA and uh, awesome organization, worked with Edwin, Alice, and I am not, I'm not a nonprofit, but employment resource team, I do partner with a lot of nonprofits. I used to be with Junta, that's how I know, um, I remember you from when I was uh, the employment and uh, economic development director at Junta, and I remember you. Caprice, but I just want to say you had mentioned, uh, your name is Tanya, that um, even though I'm a for-profit employment resource team, uh, we, I do trainings that I can assist with any type of workforce development training because one of my clients is Housing Authority of New Haven. So I work with them with their, even though they don't have undocumented, we may have one or two, but the percentages, yeah, sure. So definitely reach out to me if you're ever interested in bringing a group or having me come to your organization. We could just sit down and talk and put together some sort of training for your clients, and it will be free of charge. So that's the pro bono when you mentioned that I can offer. Okay. Thank you, Natalia. And, and thanks to Natalia, we're actually hosting here um, the the uh, panel discussion. So she offered her space. So. So it was very nice of her. Okay, so I think we have uh, one last question, and, and then we'll sort of end our, our webinar this morning. Um, I think around the table we've talked about a lot of opportunities to collaborate and share the work that we are all doing and support one another. Um, but I just want to sort of imparting remarks if people want to add anything else with regards to that, you know, very important point. Yeah, um, so this is Stefan again from Connecticut Students for a Dream. Just in wrapping up, um, we are a statewide organization, so we do have kind of like regional teams around the state in Hartford, New Haven, Danbury, uh, the Bridgeport Southwest area, uh, Willimantic. So if folks ha are working with undocumented youth in those areas, please feel free to reach out to us and, and get them connected to like, I think one of the big things we talked about is building community, and there are a lot of undocumented youth in Connecticut Students for a Dream who are currently in college, you know, working, facing all these challenges, but also knowing where some of the resources are. So it's a great way to connect. Also, our, our um, website, www.ct4dream.org, hosts its own scholarship list for scholarships for undocumented students, as well as information about how to reach out for trainings, for school staff, for colleges. So please, on the education front, feel free to reach out and use that website as well. Great. So I just learned something today as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anyone else wants to add a couple? 
Um, just to echo what Caprice said about CIRA, that stands for Connecticut Immigrant Rights Alliance, and um, that was created to bring all of us together. That's a space where any organization that serves immigrants or advocates for immigrants in the state can come together to um, to build our power and to advocate if we need to go to the legislature or to go to the governor of Connecticut or support each other. You know, if there's something great that's happening in New Haven that we want to replicate in Wallingford, um, CIRA is the place where we can all come together. And um, you can email immigrationct at Google Groups to join the, the listserv and the meetings happen once a month, and we try to have the meetings in a different part of the state each month. Um, I think it's really important for us to get out of the major cities, you know, and get around the state and reach folks who are, you know, especially challenged working in Fairfield County or Wallingford or places that have less um, less power, less less of a critical mass. Um, but that's a really great place if you're not connected to get connected with with all of us and to bring your ideas about how we can work together. Thank you, Megan. Um, I know being on the ground and uh, mental health workers, social workers, um, people like that sometimes really don't know the questions to ask or the ones that are most important um, to families. So certainly to connect with all the resources you guys have said, uh, find the right people who can help you in terms of any language barriers or just knowledge gaps that you have. Uh, the American Psychi Psychiatric Association uh, through the DSM-5 really provides you with the cultural formulation interview. That is actually just going to give you your list of questions that you can talk to families about. And it provides a lot of supplemental modules. One um, really is highlighted at section 11 that is for immigrants and refugees. It guides you through specific questions, pre-migration, post-migration, who are you living with now, are you worried about family, um, you know, in your country of origin, and really gives you step by step. I would recommend if you're going to ask the questions though, make sure you know who to connect them with if you then have a, a, you know, a question that is answered, you know, saying I am having uh, issues with immigration or I need support uh, for documentation and things like that. You can provide that resource right away um, when they answer that question. So that can just help providers guide your questions. And then I will say this, that um, I myself was an undocumented uh, child that grew up in New Haven, came around the age of five from Guatemala, and I had the opportunity to come back into my community and to continue giving back to my community, and I've been doing this work for over 20 years now. And um, all of that has only been possible a large part because of amnesty. Uh, my family, we were able to... Um, take up the opportunity in the 80s related to the amnesty bill that a Republican president passed. Um, and so when we continue pushing forward for um, immigrant rights, do it all the way, anything less will only continue causing pain and um, split families and cause trauma and fear. And I don't think that's what we want as a country. Um, and so we want people who are healthy, happy, and can thrive and continue giving back to one another. Um, and so just wanted to say that. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's great. Um, pardon remarks. Anyone else wants to say anything else? So I just want to say I, we, we're, we're going to, we went way over our time because this is a really great discussion. Um, and we won't do a recap, but you will... Um, get the salient points of our discussion. We will send those to you um, in an email with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, these are really great ideas. I think it's a follow-up. Um, it will be interesting to see if we could continue to have conversations. And I know there's different groups. We're all having conversations. Um, but to be motivated to join the discussion, um, and and uh, as Megan and Caprice has, you know, me uh, mentioned, you know, Zira, right? Yeah, join groups like Zira or follow Connecticut Students for a Dream, 
right? Uh, all of our colleagues who are doing work here, uh, you know, make sure that you are, are keep up on what the work that they're doing, the great work that they're doing. Um, so I uh, just want to thank our uh, panelists for a wonderful, uh, for taking, I mean, being really generous with your time and for the really insightful and thorough and really thought out uh, the discussion uh, really appreciated. Um, we're going to end our webinar now. Um, as I said, there's some going to be some information on specific uh, resources, uh, and I'll probably be adding more um, now that we had the discussion. We're going to be looking at uh, some of the great resources that were shared here today. So that concludes our our webinar. Thank you for joining us, and again, thank our panelists for uh, being here this morning.